those of you who are here for the first time, uh, welcome. Those of you who are here for whatever, the fifth or the sixth time or whatever, welcome back. Uh, the refreshments are provided by Older Public Title. The booklet is something that is, I have purchased it, and it is a gift from me to you. Which is, if you'd like to fold it, spindle it, mutilate it, or write in it, you are free to do so. It is yours to take with you when you leave. There are four different talks that I do for agents. I've been doing these talks uh, since probably early 2008. I have covered this material at this point with several thousand agents in groups just about this size. I like a group this size because I can see your eyes and I can see if you have a question, which is the whole idea. I'm not doing this for extra attention. I have lots of it. So I'm the entire purpose of this seminar is to convey this material to you. Each one of these subjects is a standalone subject, and she comes in, give her one of these. Hello, sweetie. Uh, each one of these subjects is a standalone subject. It would not require you, if this is the very first time you're here and you say, I know nothing about this, it will work just perfectly. You don't need any prior knowledge. Each one of them is a standalone subject. The four subjects that I've picked to do these seminars for agents, I have picked these particular subjects. These are all pieces of technology uh, as developed and discovered by L. Ron Hubbard. I'm going to cover tonight something called the conditions. The conditions technology is, in my opinion, one of the most useful. If you, if you are in business, if you have anything you do that you measure a statistic or you should be measuring a statistic, if you have some statistic, money, number of new clients, a number of closed escrows, if you have anything like that that would matter to you to have that stat go up, you're going to love what we cover tonight. If I said that there's some stuff that you would not measure uh, with a statistic, like most people would not measure the relationship with their son or daughter with a little graph on the wall. But nevertheless, your relationship with your son, your daughter, your wife, your friends, your dog, your cat, the way your house looks or the way your car looks, it is in some condition. Everything is in some <coughs> condition all of the time. You could call certain conditions utterly fabulous. You could call certain conditions utterly awful. But it's in some condition. Some things in your life are in a condition that you like that way and you would love to keep it that way. One of the things we're going to cover tonight is how you keep things that you like the way they are and make them better so you don't have deteriorate. And the areas that you don't like, we're going to cover how to fix it. The first thing I want to have you do, and if you're following this online, I've provided a link for you so that you can go to scientologyhandbook.org and get the appropriate information. But for you guys here in the room, go to page 7. Go to page 7 in your booklet and you will see 12 different operating states or the names of 12 different conditions. Each one of these flows one from the next, but they are 12 distinct states of operation. At the very top you have power, at the very bottom you have confusion. Most of us are at one of the conditions in most of the areas of our life, not at that very top or not at that very bottom. We're somewhere in between. Now what makes what we're going to cover tonight incredible, just, just utterly incredible, and I realize that could sound like a sales pitch, but you're already here. This is not to get you to arrive, it's to just tell you what we're looking at here. What makes this amazing is not that Mr. Hubbard discovered that there were 12 different states of operation and gave them names. That is not what's remarkable. What's remarkable is that each one of these conditions, each one of them has its own specific formula. I get this. And if you follow the formula as it's laid out in the little booklet you can take home with you tonight, if you do those steps, even if you do them stupidly, even if you do them crudely, as long as you just do them, and you do them in the sequence, like if it says do one, two, three, four, do not alter the sequence. I'll cover more on that in a little bit, why that's true. But you must, to make it work, you have to do them in the order they're listed. That's true for each condition. 
And you'll see more when we get into this why that's true. If you alter the sequence or do the wrong formula, you will drop down a minimum of one condition below the one you were in. If you do the formula in the correct sequence, do the correct formula in the correct sequence, you will come up into the state directly above it. That makes sense. Yes. This does not require faith, belief, or any other thing. It is just a mechanical fact of the way the world works. If you follow the sequence, you'll come up. And if you keep following the sequence, you would go up into power. And if you, if you did the formula for power, you could stay in power. Literally. So, any question on anything I've said so far? Anything. This makes sense. So, if we look here, and we're going to talk about statistics a little bit, and I want to show you, go to page 11, and I want you to see there on page 11 two different graphs that are graphing the same thing. It wouldn't make any difference whether that graph was number of new contacts, uh, number of listing appointments, uh, number of dollars earned, and if we just just pretend it's something that matters to you and you want more of it. It won't matter what it is right now. So if you look at the graph on the left, these are both graphing exactly the same thing. The one on the left is an improperly scaled graph that does not show changes in a statistic accurately, thus making the graph less useful. Actually, pretty much useless. Because changes aren't observable. If you look at the graph on the right, you will see a correctly scaled graph, and you can see the difference. The one on the, the, one on the left hand side starts at zero on the bottom and goes up to 100,000. Let's pretend that was someone's income. And, and let's pretend further it was someone's monthly income. And the guy goes, well, I'm going to start it at zero and go up to 100,000 a month. Now, could you make $100,000 in a month? Yes. Are you likely to make a hundred? Are you likely to, to earn a hundred thousand dollars in say the next twelve weeks per month? If you say no, then you wouldn't want a hundred at the top of your graph. When the answer is yes, change the scaling on your graph. The graph on the right, notice it goes from two thousand at the bottom, like that's as low as it could go for the guy foreseeably. You understand? And at the top, he has twelve thousand. But notice how little changes are observable and how by looking at that graph I can clearly see the slant of the line and see which direction things are happening. So the first statement I'm going to make is that of the 12 conditions I showed you on page 7, all of the conditions from non-existence up, this is not proof of the conditions below non-existence, but all of the conditions from non-existence up can be spotted by a properly scaled graph. I want to say that again because this is an amazing piece of information. If you have the graph properly scaled to where you can see meaningful changes occur, you could spot what condition you're in just by the slant of the line on the graph. And if you'll turn to page 13, you'll see the beginning of some samples of graphs. Top left on page 13 shows an example. It says at the very top of the page, reading statistics. Top left is non-existence. A non-existence graph. Pretend it was, I don't know, number of phone calls answered correctly and the receptionist didn't show up for work. You get the idea that the graph would just plummet. Now you could see a non-existence graph that's just flat along the bottom. But no one came to work. That's what the graph would look like. And whether your organization has 25 people in it reporting to you or only you reporting to you, you have all of the divisions of any organization. So you could have your quality control division doing fairly well and your new contact division doing horribly. You, you understand? Like uh, some agents go, I take a lot of pride in my work and uh, a really terrific service, and we always return a phone call. And I go, good, but if you're doing three deals a year, that's bad. And I realize these are value judgments on my part, but I'm going to stick with my statement. If you're doing three deals a year, I'm going to classify it as bad. 
unless you've just started working and only been working for a month, then I'll call it good if you'll continue doing at least that many. You understand? Like, is the statistic in a viable range would enter into this? Over on the right side at the top, you see a sharply down graph you, that we'd call that danger. If that were your income graph, this is not an esoteric thing on these words, if, you, if that were an income graph, you're going to be in danger if you don't reverse the trend. On the left middle, you see a condition called emergency, and I want you to notice the definition of emergency. An emergency statistic is slightly down or level. Slightly down or level is emergency. If you say, I like to earn $5,000 a month and I'm comfortable keeping it there, well, good luck with that program. You're either going to expand or you're going to contract. Pick one. Keeping it there in the middle for any length of time is just simply not on the menu. You can go, I don't like that answer, and I'll go, yeah, I understand. I've been there, but that's the deal. You're going to expand or you're going to contract. So you're not going to stay. So slightly down our level. If a person made $5,000 a month, if they made 10000 what make wouldn't make any difference what the number was. Inflation alone says you make less every month. Inflation alone says every year, if you made the same amount of money, you're actually making less money, just by the mere fact of inflation. Does that make sense? So emergency is slightly down or level, and the, on the right-hand side there, that is an example of a normal graph slightly up. Not sharply up, slightly up would be a condition of normal. Each one of these states has a formula. We're going to cover a couple of them. Affluence is steeply up. That's an example of an affluence graph. You suddenly started making more money than you ever had before, or that you had recently. That would be a condition of affluence. Just as a point, affluence is the condition where the formula is most often violated people routinely violate the condition of affluence. I mean, it is done so, it, it is so routine that it is commonplace. You know, you get people that they win the lottery. I, I can tell you as a statistical fact, the average person that wins the lottery two years later is broke in the bank trying to use their future winnings to borrow money because they mismanaged it that horribly. You go, how do you screw that up? Right? It's just routinely done. It's just routinely done. Any questions on anything so far? Anything. I'm doing a hell of a great job, or missing the book completely. You guys are either half asleep. No, I missed two or three words you said there, Russell. What were they? About the steeply up and the affluence. Mm -hmm. You sort of turned the other way and you said, if if you do something or other, and he nodded his head, raised his hand over there, that he might Okay, violate the condition of affluence. Yeah. If, if, if the, the condition of affluence which would be a graph that's steeply up. Like you suddenly, it's like a windfall. Like the guy was making 5000 a month and now he's at 12000 Yeah, but what will happen? That is the condition, affluence, which is most routinely mishandled. Like let's say a guy is normally selling 15 houses a year and something occurs, apparently out of his control, where he now sold 25. You would think that if a person could observe, well, if I just now sold 25 and I used to sell 15, that whatever the hell I did to sell 25, if I just kept doing it, I could always sell 25. That isn't the pattern. The actual pattern is people, the stat skyrockets up, and then they apparently do whatever they have to do to get it back down to that regular range. There's an amount of money I'm not going to make this whole talk about money, but there's an amount of money that for each person is the correct amount to have. It's an interesting point. It's just this is, this is right. And if a person gets below that amount, that correct amount for them, they'll do whatever the hell they have to do to get it back up to the right amount. If they wind up with a windfall, affluence, their stat shoots up, the extra money is apparently not correct, it's not right, and they'll do what they have to do to waste whatever the excess is to get back down to that correct amount. Does that make sense? You don't have no choice? Well, you have a choice, but you'd have to change something. 
So, but the point is just, I'm just saying this is what people typically do. Like, if you look at, if, if you jump back just to page seven again, and said, look, look at those, look, let's actually look at the names of each one of those conditions. You have power at the very top. Below that, you have power change, and we're not going to work on that one right now. So you have power, affluence, below that normal operation, below that emergency, below that danger, below that non-existence. Non-existence would be like no one there. Look what's right below non-existence, liability. Like imagine someone who comes in to answer the phone at your company and it's so awful, the phone, it, you'd be better off if the phone went unanswered rather than letting them answer it. You understand? So not that, like, below non-existence you have liability. Like it's a liability to have that person around. It's a liability to have that person unwatched. Below liability you have a condition of doubt. The person isn't certain whether or not they even want to be there. And below that you have enemy, below that you have treason, treason's below enemy because it's betrayal after trust, and at the very bottom you have confusion. But take a look at doubt. What would you think the percentage is, really, of real estate agents whose entire career is one giant colossal condition of doubt? They aren't even sure. I mean, seriously. You, you talk, I mean, I talk to thousands and thousands and thousands of agents. And you get stuff like, well, you know, I don't know if I should get a website. I mean, seriously. Uh, you, you look at how, if you look, how long does it take to sell a house? Seriously. If you took a stop, you know how lawyers that are, that are working on a percentage, they, they keep a track, like, like a stopwatch. They're, they're literally... Like, I spent 10 minutes working on this guy's file or whatever, or 30 minutes or an hour and a half, and they just charge him by the hour. How many hours would you think on average, how many days does it take to sell a house to a person? If you took the entire time you spend showing them property, driving them around, finding the house, writing up the contract, doing the back and forth, fiddling with the escrow, showing up for the inspections, closing the deal, but seriously, overall, there's, there's exceptions to it, but you're going to wind up with some, number, some amount of time, like two or three days total. Two or three days total to sell a house to a person. Close it and whole deal. Now, here's, here's, here's what's fantastic. I don't even have the current... The average Keller Williams agent sells six houses a year. I don't know what the Realty One average is. I haven't bothered to compute it. The last time I looked... At John Hall's figure, this was back in 2006, the average John Hall agent sold 10 and a half houses a year. That was with my numbers and Callaway's mixed in, by the way. The average John Hall agent was doing 10 and a half houses a year. Colwell Banker was doing 11. At that time, uh, realty executives were still bragging that they were selling, and their agents were selling an average, I think, of 21 or 22 houses and REMAX was saying they were leading the national field with around 23 houses a year. You take the average price of a house in Phoenix and multiply it times any of those numbers and put two and a half or three percent in there and you tell me is that a fabulous deal? And if the person selling ten houses a year, let's just use that number because I can do the math in my head, if the person selling ten houses a year, and let's be generous and say it takes three days to sell a house, so they're working one month out of the year and taking 11 months off? Do you understand? Like this, literally, if they went to work on Mondays, they could do this, if they went to work on Monday and said, I work on Mondays from 8 until 6 p.m., if you want to see a house, if you want to, whatever the hell it is you want, it'll be Monday between those hours, and took the entire, if they actually worked, and took the rest of the time off, they'd make the same amount of money. They'd make the same amount of money they're currently making. Actually, they'd make more because they'd be more disciplined. They'd actually have more control over what the hell they're doing. So when you have someone who isn't sure this is what they want to do, that is doubt. You understand? There is a formula for doubt. And if a person doesn't do the doubt formula, there's a formula for doubt, and if a person doesn't do the doubt formula, they could remain in doubt forever on that subject. They never come out of doubt. See, if you say, well, the three possible answers to any question would be yes, no, and maybe. 
Would you like a Coke? Yes. Would you like a Coke? No. Would you like a Coke? Oh, yeah, well, I like the taste, but I mean the caffeine. Oh, wait, just a second. Okay, now change the question to, do you want to buy a house? Do you want to sell a house? But how about the fantastic question of, are you a realtor? Is this what you do? I've talked to agents and I say, well, what, what if you knew? What if you knew this is what you were going to do for the rest of your life, rest of your working life, this is what you were going to do for a living, you're going to be screamingly successful at it. Would you then ever have a question on, should I get a website? Should I do this? Should I do that? Or do you think the question would sort of answer itself? And the response, they go, well, if you put it that way. What other way is there to put it? What other way would you like it put? Am I going to dork around and see, instead of taking a really long time to, I'm, I'm not going to fail out quickly, I'm going to drag it out. I'm going to stretch this crap out to the point where it hurts. Just, I like misery, and I don't want to just go, I'm done, I'm leaving. Let's just stretch it out for a couple of years and just show what can be done on half-assing, even leaving. You get the idea? That's doubt. Because if a person, but do you understand, each one of these is a state of operation, and each one of them has a formula. Now, we won't have time tonight to do all 12 of the formulas to the point where I can go with complete clarification. But you can read, and this is yours to take with you. But my, the point I'm getting at is, if you misapply, now, let's take a look now. Let's, let's go to page 15. Now there's two examples on page 15 that one of them, they're both examples of a non-existence graph. These are both examples of a non-existence graph. One of them is a stat that plummets down. The other one is a stat that stays across the bottom. We can give that one to Sherry. One of them is a graph that plummets down, and one of them is a graph that stays along the bottom. If you turn the page to page 16, you will see an example at the top of a danger trend, and notice that word trend, that's not, that's not a one week thing. Do you see that that stat in danger, and you, we're calling it like, like slightly, like sharply down, that is danger. And just imagine if that were your gross income stat. But make it better, if that were the number, if we were graphing the number of new buyers you work with, the number of people you're currently showing property to at any given time the number of listing appointments you're going on. You just understand, if we were graphing those things, do you understand if I said your number of listing appointments graph is in danger, couldn't we then easily predict that your income graph will, will soon be in danger if it's not already? You, you get the idea. Like there's about a 100-day lag from the time you do the stuff that matters or not and get paid for it in our business. So there's a, there's a little bit of a trick for real estate agents in the sense that you could, oh, I don't know, in the month of July, work like hell and go, my income didn't go up. But let's pretend you did everything perfectly. But you'd find that income from July's work materializing mystically in September. Or you could screw off the entire month of July which is, by the way, one of the highest months for collected cash for realtors, you could screw off the entire month going, isn't it amazing? I'm just having fun at the lake, but look at how much money I'm getting. And be completely <laughs> oblivious to this is a result of work you did about 60 to 90 to 120 days ago. And you would go, oh, this is amazing, I'm having the time of my life, and then in September you'd go, I can't believe I'm making this little amount of money. But if you were graphing, see, there's certain stats that you could call leading indicators, and there's certain stats that are lagging indicators. Your income is a lagging indicator. You got that? Like in, in the real estate business, prices, <coughs> prices are a lagging indicator the rate of foreclosures would be a leading indicator. You were looking at the health of the economy and where it's headed and so forth. So you hear you have a danger trend. At the bottom of page 16, that's an emergency trend. Remember, emergency is slightly down or level. So 
So there you have a graph that's level. So you could say with a graph like that, is that is, if a person stayed in that condition, are they headed for something bad economically? If, if, the, if what's being measured is money or something that would lead to money? The answer is yeah, they actually are. Now look at the top of page 17. That's a normal trend. If a person had their graph in a normal trend, what could you predict? What's going to happen for them? Good stuff. Yeah. They're just gonna, like, it's just going to keep getting better incrementally. Now look at that one that seems to be kind of all over the place, bottom of page 17. That's an affluence trend. You see it has its ups and downs, but man, oh man, look at the slant. If you were to take and put a ruler kind of through that thing and kind of tilt it, you'd go, you keep up at that rate, you're, this is going to go really, really well for you. You understand? And if you turn the page to page 18, you will see an example of affluence going into power. And power is really normal in a high new range. So a person gets it up from affluence into power and keeps it there. Now, you could be, let's just talk about power, if you've been in real estate, I don't know, five, six years, four, five, six years, and you have some customers that would not think of buying a house from anyone but you. They wouldn't think of selling their house from anyone but you. That's a condition of power. You're in power with that customer. The person who called you on the phone, who doesn't know you because they saw your sign and called off the sign, you're in a condition of non-existence with them. The correct formula with that guy on the phone would be the non-existence formula. Get, get the difference here. Overall, in your business, you might be in a condition of normal. So you could have a your business, and overall, you're in a condition of normal. With this one particular customer, you're in a condition of power. And with the guy who just calls you on the phone, the correct formula would be the non-existence formula. Is this making sense? Because it would apply to whatever you're applying it to, whatever condition you're trying to make better. Again, any questions on anything so far? Anything? Anything? I think what you have just explained connects with something I've just personally experienced. Some other. You said if you uh, did something in July, you may not see the income from it until September. Correct. In fact, let me take out the may not, probably will not. Okay. It would be rare every once in a while I used to call them miracle escrows, uh, but, but every once in a while you have the deal occur where guy calls you up, sign call, whatever, kind of a fluke. Uh, you take them over, you show them a house, they go, I'll take it. Uh, the deal closes in 10 days, then they had something else fall out. You already had an appraisal on this one, and they already were pre-approved from a different one, and the next thing you know, it's a slam dunk, and 10 days later you're paid. And you're like, isn't this fabulous? Well, it is fabulous, but it's really analogous <coughs> to winning the lottery uh, because if it's a statistic or a product that you're going to causatively create, you, you understand the difference between something happened, you be like people that go, oh, you're not going to believe this. I was thinking of Aunt Zelda, and Aunt Zelda called me. Isn't that miraculous? <laughs> I have telepathy. Oh, dear God, isn't this amazing? Well, the first thing you know is it's out of their control. If it were in their control, they wouldn't even be commenting on it. Because if, if, it were, if it were fully in their control, it would be like, you're not going to believe this. I was at a restaurant. I told the waitress, bring me a glass of water in addition to the coffee. I drank the water. Can you believe it? It's at that level if it was under control. So you go back to when some, if, there's, if there's a type of thing that happens in your business that you couldn't go make happen again, it's not under your control. So if you were going to have a predictable business, if you were going to have an income stream that you caused to occur, and then you could cause it to get bigger, you could cause it to be better, cause it to be fuller, cause it to flow faster, it would have to be something you're doing, that you could control the something. So although miracle escrows are nice, they're rare. And you're not causing them in the sense it has that I was in the right place at the right time. And if a person's business model is, I try to show up in the right place at the right time, all the time, they've just told me, I depend on luck 
And um, what I, I think of it as God's will. If God wants me to make more, the money will come to me. But if you wanted you to make more, even when nobody else said, let me help you make it, then you better have a plan of how you're going to get it. So of all the skills that matter in real estate, of all the skills that matter in real estate, of all the competencies that make the difference, there is one skill in real estate that matters more than all the other skills combined in terms of predicting your income. And that would be your ability to lead generate. If you can competently, causatively lead generate, which is not the same thing as lead convert, most agents who survive are actually amazingly good at lead conversion. If they just survive at all, they're actually astoundingly good at lead conversion because they have to be because they're so god-awful at lead generation. You understand what I'm saying? But they have an ability to take that guy who wasn't and they just grind it out and find the next thing you know they got a deal. Good, but if you were going to have a business and not a continual desperate job, you would have to become competent at lead generation. Get the difference there. And there is no business plan, there is no business model, there is nothing possible that you would, would be you getting more money that would not include you getting better at lead generation. Period. Now, there are exactly, in spite of all the people running around the world going, they can teach you their secret method, and it's so incredible, and you have to come to their class, or you must be coached, and if you don't go to Mike Ferry, my dear God, you couldn't possibly live, <laughs> uh, blah, 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 blah. The fact of the matter is, there are exactly two ways, really, two categories for lead generation. They are prospecting and marketing. That is the end of the list. All lead generation techniques or methods fall into one of those two categories. Prospecting, it is something you do where you reach out to them. Marketing is something you do to get them to reach to you. That is the end of the list. Marketing is a subject. It is something you learn. It is an advantage to you that you don't have a lot of money to spend on marketing because if you did, you would waste it all doing poor marketing. Trust me, I've tested this personally. So I'm saying to you, if you learn to prospect, you will learn what the buttons are that you could then later <coughs> use for marketing. If you get what I just said. But in the beginning, you prospect, which is you do something to reach to customers. There are numerous methods of prospecting. Could you door knock? Yes. Could you make cold calls? Could you make warm calls? Could you call on people who already sort of know you? Could you call on the friends of people that know you? All of those things. That latter one probably is going to give you the best bang for your buck in terms of prospecting time. People you sort of know. The people you already completely know, your mom, your dad, your brother, your best friend, you're going to get the business or not anyway. So repeatedly calling your brother on the phone 15 times a week will not gift you any higher likelihood of getting the listing than if you called him twice a year. Understand, you were going to get that deal or not anyway. So calling on people you sort of know would almost always, if you were going to look at your previously met or your unmet database, even if you didn't have a database, contacting previously met database would be the number one method of generating business. Yes? I did what you told me to do the, uh, the last time we met. Mm -hmm. And I talked to 80 people. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, is this what I've got in production, is it cause or is it a miracle? Because none of that turned into transactions, but I listed four homes and sold two since I was here. If you'll go out when the person is stuck, which is what you were, which is stuck, Weren't, you, you weren't flowing anything. It was a stuckness. So going out and contacting people does a couple things. One of the things it does is it has you physically out and about contacting people. And you might or might not get business from the people you contact. But most assuredly happen 
happens when you get out and make contacts, it opens up your flows. It gets you as a being out and in communication. You actually look better and look different than you did the last time you were here. This, this is an example. It gets you out and in communication. And when you're in communication, you're going to do more business, period. No matter, it's, it's, this is not a matter of, let me give you a good script to use. No, 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 no. When you're there, when you're alive, like a being, this is a quote from Mr. Hubbard, a being is as alive as they can communicate. A being will be as successful in life as their ability to communicate. I don't mean just talk, like, but, but actually reach people. Like you go, hi, how are you? Uh, you, you know that deal when you go to a store and they go, find everything okay? Are they actually, is anyone, like, it's a ro they could have had a robot thing. When, they, when you cross the line, the little light goes off and they have the voice go, find everything okay? Because no one's really asking. But when a person says something to another person, you could do this with an animal. There are people who can talk to horses. There's people who talk to their dog. And the dog, I don't think the dog speaks that much English. <laughs> but the dog understands. You, understand, you, you can talk to your cat, and the cat, they'll, they'll respond to your flow. So it's the same thing. You show up. We don't, in our business, sell people houses they didn't want. We're never selling a house to somebody who goes, I didn't want to buy one, but the salesman was so damn good, I, I couldn't believe it, I bought three. Uh, we don't, that's not the way it works. They already wanted a house. They already wanted a house, so they wouldn't have been calling on the sign or clicking endlessly on a website. There's something they wanted to find out about a house. And if they want a house, and they can buy one, and they want to buy one, they got to live somewhere, so it, it, you know, and you're the one that catches the, the call or the click, and you do something with it. How tricky is it? Like seriously, how tricky can it be? They they wanted to do it, and it's a, this is a service business. Take a look here on page 19. This is the, the non-existence formula. The condition of non-existence it says this is this is find a communication line. Make yourself known. Discover what is needed or wanted, do produce and are presented. Let's connect that to something like a sign call. Guy calls on a sign, and you answer the phone, and you say, hello, it's me, Johnny from Colwell Banker. <laughs> you don't have to say Colwell Banker, but whatever company you're with, use that name. So. <laughs> He says, I'm the, the house on Elm Street. I'm calling on that house. And he goes, that, you tell him what it is. Oh, no, that's too much. That's not what I was looking for. Tell me what you're looking for. He goes, we wanted something for around two and a quarter. We wanted to with the pool or whatever. And you find out what he wants. You run a search in MLS. You take him out, show him the house. And he goes, this is exactly, thank you so much. You're a godsend. Isn't that pretty much the way it goes? When it's successful? I, I used to have a guy that worked for me as a buyer agent. He was a retired attorney. And I had more complaints on him from customers. They'd always call in and go, well, it's probably his age. No, no, it wasn't his age. He doesn't listen to anyone no matter what they said. Because no matter what they said, he knew best what they really ought to be buying. So he would argue with people. <laughs> I'm not making this up. He would argue with them and then try to tell them, that's not really what you want. Here's the kind of house you want. He got mad at me for not buying a house he thought I ought to buy. And I thought, it's nothing like what I would ever want. And he was still, you know, you should have bought that house. <coughs> he had a no best. I know that's rare for attorneys, but he did. <laughs> so there's an expanded non-existence formula on page 23. There's a formula here for danger. The formula for danger is that it starts there at the bottom of page 25. Just look at that first step for danger. Think of your kids walking into the street, little Oscars walking into the street, bypass, bypass the junior or juniors normally in charge of the activity and handle it personally. Step two, handle the situation, any danger in it. The kids walking into the street, and this is, well, I don't want to interfere with your self-determinism, but if there's a car coming, the hell with his self-determinism, you yank him out of the way. You bypass. So if your stat's in danger, you would bypass your habits and normal routines. Well, I usually like, the hell with what you usually like. Get the stat up. There's my aunt. I told you that. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. You understand? You see it right here on page 26, first dynamic. This is self. 
It says bypass habits or normal routines. Just literally. Yes, sir. So these formulas are re in reaction to the conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I, I thought the formulas were to bring about the conditions. No. Thank you for the question. The formulas are when you're in that condition, this is the formula, like there's the danger formula. The first formula for danger on the bottom of page 25 and at the next part, that is the formula for danger if you're handling someone else. If you're handling yourself, it's one called the first dynamic danger formula. If you're handling you that, if you're in danger, that is the, those are the steps that you would follow to get, now get this, to get out of danger, and look, and look at page seven, if you came out of danger, what's the next step up? Emergency. Out of danger and up into emergency. That's exactly what would be going on. So, uh, okay, no. uh, are we trying to get up the scale to the top, to the power? Well, I would hope you're trying to get up at least as high as normal and stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you follow these formulas one by one until you get there? Yeah, like let's say it this way. Let's, let's just use an example. Okay. Let's say a guy's in danger. So there's six steps to the danger formula. Okay. There's six steps to the danger formula. You see them there on page 26. Yes. Uh -huh. After you've done step six of danger, it will flow directly into, go to page 30, step one of emergency would be your next step. See, after you did the six steps of danger, okay. your next step would be step one. It would just it's like a ladder. You just you know you're at the bottom of that next level up. What is interesting about the condition of emergency, what is to me fascinating, this is not something I would say to everyone I talk to, but if I'm talking to working realtors, I don't mean brokers now, I'm talking to agents out selling houses, the people that sell houses for a living, like list and sell houses for a living, I would say that most working agents are unbelievable experts at applying step one of emergency. They are so damn good at it that it's astounding. It's like a science. It's, no, it's an art because they don't really know what it is they do. They, they apply step one of emergency. They have no deals. They have no business. Life is awful. And the agent goes and does something. Let me just make something in quotes. They, they go and do something that they couldn't later tell you what the hell it was. It was almost like just a series of lucky breaks. Uh, it usually is they contacted people in a previously met database just to give you a name for this mysterious something they did. Their stat goes up, and notice that step two of emergency is change your operating basis. That is never touched or brushed against, and step three, economize, is completely ignored prepare to deliver, it's just they skip the rest of the steps, but the stat pops. And of course they wait for it to crash again and come back and do step one of emergency once again. And have a life that seems like almost on the subject of money, welcome to hell. <laughs> but it's because they're doing step one of emergency and not completing the formula. Now remember when we started this evening, at approximately 50 minutes ago, I said it was imperative that you do the sequence as it's given. I want you to notice that step three of emergency is economize. This is an important point. This is not more important than the other, but I want you to notice that step three of emergency is economize. Then I want you to turn the page over to page 34, because I want to show you something. I want to draw your attention to step one of affluence is economize. The word has not changed its meaning. Economize is step three of emergency. Economize is step one of affluence. So if a person is in emergency, and most people when they go into, most companies when they go into emergency, most countries when they go into emergency, will attempt to handle it by applying step three, economize first. 
that will always lead to disaster. I'll repeat that. If you go into emergency and apply economize first, you will shrink, do less, and fail to grow and fail to handle. If in affluence you don't apply economize first, you will piss through all the money in such short order, it won't matter what else you do, you'll be broke again fast. So again, there's a sequence here and you need to do, to make it work, you need to do each of the steps in that formula and in that order. I'm not, this is not mystical. And it, here, here's the deal. Every time in the history of the world that, that you have ever or anybody has ever made things better, this has happened. Lots of people, millions of people make things better. They didn't have this little booklet and they didn't know Ron Hubbard and they didn't have this data. Every time someone did it and made it work right, once you know this material well enough, you'll be able to see what I'm about to say. They followed the sequences given here even if they didn't know they were following. You understand? They instinctively did the correct thing as it's laid out here, and that's why it got better. They didn't quite understand what they had just done, so it became, well, Charlie just has a knack. When the business is in trouble, if you can get Charlie in here, he somehow knows what to do. And he does. You understand? But he couldn't teach it. He couldn't convey it because it was his knack. You get it? He just knew what to do. And he was right. That pilot, uh, Sullenberger, the guy who landed the flight, you can look this on Google. This is fantastic. He did the exact opposite. He saved everyone's life. He did the exact opposite of what the manual told him to do. And if you have the slightest question on it, Google it and find out. He did the exact opposite. He had so many thousands of hours of experience as a pilot, as a captain of a He knew damn good and well, if I do this, the plane's going to crash. He just didn't feel, and he did the, and landed and put it in the Hudson and saved everyone's life. But the point is, if, you're do, if, you, if you look back, when you, after you know this material, Every single time you made something better, you took whatever the, you, you actually applied the condition without knowing you were. And every time you loused it up, you misapplied the condition. If you look at affluence, if you go back to affluence and go, step one of affluence is economize. What, what usually happens when someone starts making a lot more money? Yeah, but one thing, well, in my job, not my hell, I, I can't wear those kind of suits to work anymore. I'm a blah, blah now. And I certainly can't live in a, I need another house, a bigger car, I mean, a Cadillac, I'm not even trying to drive a Jaguar, or, I'm not like the Benz, I better get a Benz. But you understand, there's nothing wrong with any, but they buy it on time payments. They use the money for the down payments on stuff. I knew top agents in 2006, they had, didn't have two homes, they had three homes. I knew a guy quite, quite well. He had his own jet plane. So when he flew to Austin, ha <laughs> he wasn't on a damn commercial. His pilot took him. Do you think that he was misapplying affluence a teeny little bit? You think so? Look what it says there. Step one of affluence, economy. Now the very first thing you must do in affluence is economize. And then make very, very sure that you don't buy anything that has any future commitment to it. Don't buy anything with any future commitments. Don't hire anybody with any future commitments. Nothing. That's all part of that economy. Clamp it down. You made more money or you got more money than you had before. <coughs> what do you do with the money? Step one, nothing. Hide it. Stop. <laughs> Step two, this is going to be far out, pay every bill, get every bill you can possibly scrape up from any place, every penny you owe under the sun, moon, and stars, and pay them. That's step two of affluence. Step three, invest the remainder in service facilities, make it more possible to deliver. 
And if you want a good working definition for a service facility, what would make it more possible to deliver? If you go, well, for me, it'd be an iPad, or well, then get an iPad, you understand? Or you go, I need a new car, get one. This is where you would go spend that money. You take the excess money you now have, buy a different car. Some woman might go, God, I need new shoes. Get some. I've talked to women that said, well, what really makes me happy, what really makes me happy is new shoes. But I couldn't possibly afford to buy shoes every time I, the hell you couldn't. If you got really good at lead generation, if, every, if you say, well, getting new fancy shoes makes me so happy, yeah, here's a little trick. Go get a pair and then lead generate. <laughs> Seriously, go get a pair and then leave. Well, those shoes cost uh, $200. I'll stick with my statement. I don't know where you're going to keep them all. But you can afford them. You understand? If you connected it to lead generation, it says invest the remainder in service facilities, make it more possible to deliver. And look at step four of affluence. Discover what caused the condition of affluence and strengthen it. Can you see how if you did those four steps, you would go on up into power? Do you see that? And can you see? Yeah. On page 18, you show that you're going up the ladder. Page 18? Yeah. Okay, let me go to it. Oh, 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 okay. You can't really keep going up, 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 up. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's, let's take your question. I got it now. Perfect question. Thank you. So here, what you're looking at on page 18 is you're looking at a graph and you're looking at affluence. Notice how the first part of the graph is affluence and you're looking at affluence moving into power. So the guy was in this much lower range. This applies to you very definitely. You were in a much lower range. You've been getting it up, getting it up, getting it up, getting it up. Now, when you get up near the top like that, maintain it, maintain that level, and now you're in power. There's a formula for power, which we haven't covered. And the and first. How do you know when you're in power? What is that? What is that? Not well, there's different levels of power. I mean, you, you, you don't, I don't want to say, like, let's say that you had an agent uh, that had been doing, hell, I don't know, 10 deals a year and they've now gotten it up to 70 deals a year. Now, for me, 70 deals would be like, dear God, uh, I mean, if, if we were down at 250 deals, we're, we're broke, we're not making any money. So that's what I mean, so you yeah, yeah. Well, it's relative, relative to you. Okay, so then you continually level off. You do it again, yeah. Do it again. Okay. yeah. I you mean, you, you go, let, let's make it this way. Let's say, let's, let's take power. Let's, let's talk about power. Let's say that a guy was, in fact, I want to actually show you this, because this will actually help answer your question. Let's go to page 36. And the, there's the example there of a, of a bricklayer. And we're going to say this guy is the best bricklayer that ever lived. I don't know what we want it, but just, just for the sake of understanding, he's the person achieved a total abundance of production that nothing can imperil, a condition of power exists. So this person has laid more bricks in a day, and he gets to a certain, but there's a certain point of this is, he's maxing. Like the bricklayer would hit a point where this is it. This is as many bricks as that bricklayer is ever going to lay in a day. If he starts work at 6 o'clock and works until 6 o'clock, or whatever you want to do it, he'll still hit a point no matter how fast he is, no matter how competent he is, no matter how awesome he is, no matter how fast his speed of particle flow is, he maxes at some point. Like, this is it. This is as fast as it gets. This is as good as it gets. For him as a person in a condition of power. Okay? To maintain that, it has a, it's just covered in the first law of powers, don't disconnect. But what would happen, obviously, if a guy was that good a bricklayer in the real world? He would have customers, I mean, just imagine, people who needed bricks laid, they'd go, well, get him. He's just the greatest guy of all. Get, get him. But there's a certain point where he can't, I mean, what would he do? He'd be hiring a help. He'd be hiring, well, I could get this other guy to bring me the wheelbarrow full of bricks, and this one can bring me the wheelbarrow full of motor. And you get the idea, and then eventually you'd go, I need a bookkeeper. 
uh, well, God, I, you know, it, he, he would fight delegating, and eventually it would dawn on him, you know what, I could even hire someone else to lay the bricks. I'm so damn good at getting bricklaying jobs now. I'm so amazing at getting bricklaying jobs, and I'm going to never give up quality control. Like, I'm always going to walk around and look at how the bricks were laid, and are they being laid properly, and are the customers thrilled as always. So you get the idea. He could keep expanding. But it would be at a new level. So you could go up, I don't know, let's say the guy goes into power, and he maintains power as the sole bricklayer. Now, coming back to your question, could he then be almost like a non-existence of moving out of brick lane where only his friends and close pals knew what an awesome brick layer and become the best brick layer in the city, well-known people, you understand he could keep growing. And he'd apply, here's, here's another way to look at what condition you're in. If you're having trouble, because this is, I think is the actual answer to your question, if you're ever looking this over and you're having trouble figuring out what formula should I be applying, so I think that's actually your question. You're in that first power. Yeah, well, if you, if, once you know these, literally go through and go, which one of these formulas, if I applied it in its full sequence right now, would raise my stats the most? If you just took that approach, you'd, you'd be working out backwards which one you're actually in. But it would work. It would still work. Because you could get a person that goes into power. Is, you, you know, power is a condition that is routinely violated. Like, I'll give you an example of uh, in the performing arts of an artist that never violated power to my knowledge. Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen started off playing small clubs. Bruce Springsteen could play nothing but giant arenas if he wanted to. Bruce Springsteen still plays small clubs. Makes it a point to. Makes it a point to play. And my point here isn't something about music. It's about an artist's connection with his public. Let me give you an example of an amazing artist who routinely violated power and then wisened up. I suspect someone literally said to him, John, would you look at this and stop not doing this? Uh, John Travolta. John Travolta his first big movie, I think, was, uh, say it again, Saturday Night Fever. He was so magnetic that half the country wanted to make their hair like him, get the pointy shoes, get the disco pants, and it started to craze. He then later did a movie called Urban Cowboy, and there were more cowboy boots sold in the next few years than probably any time in the last hundred years. He had made so many movies that were so, like, he just does an impact. He did something that was outlandish. After every time he'd make an amazing movie, he would take like a year off. So at the height of his popularity, he would go out of touch. So he must have had at least a, what the public thought of as a half a dozen comebacks. Like every time he'd come, like this, huh, say it again. Pulp Fiction, now here's, here's an interesting story on Pulp Fiction, you're absolutely right. Pulp Fiction, uh, what's the name of the guy who did the Pulp Fiction? Tarantino. Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino wanted Travolta. The producers didn't want Travolta at all. They didn't want him and Tarantino wasn't going to make the movie without him. The producers, to try to get rid of Travolta, offered him and he took $300,000. That was his total pay for Pulp Fiction. They were trying to get rid of him. They didn't want him. From their point of view, he was a has-been. But what's interesting about that, he did that, then has this amazing resurgence, and at that time, somebody said, would you look at this and maybe think about how you might apply it? But what was interesting, he hasn't made less than a movie a year since then. He hasn't made less than the first law of power, don't disconnect. That's all, that's all I'm trying to point out. The first law of power is don't disconnect. You have customers, clients, that wouldn't consider using anyone but you. You stay in touch with them somehow. You go, well, I don't go to lunch. It doesn't say go to lunch. It says don't disconnect. Don't deny your connections. They look to you as the one. You're the one. You're the person. You're their person. That's your deal. 
Uh, and you can't move off of a post. This is number two of power. The first thing you have to do is make a record of all of its lines. And that's the only way you'll ever be able to disconnect. Law of power. So you have these formulas. Uh, if we looked at, let's, let's take a condition of normal. If you're in a condition of normal. Are you in a, is it ideal when you're going up the ladder of all these conditions? No, 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 no. I don't want to make some significance out of it. When you do a formula, here's the thing. You want to do the formula for the condition that you're in. So let's take, for example, the emergency formula. And you do step one of emergency, promote. You go out and hustle up some business. So let's take a look at that where it says promote. And I want to put this in its correct perspective. Step one of emergency is promote. Remember how I said economize is step three? Right? Let's talk about it. Let me, let me flesh that one out. Promote. This is on page three. So it says promote. Does that say find some money to promote or make sure you save up some money and then promote? Or does it say promote? Promote. So step one of emergency is promote. Well, Homes Illustrated uh, won't run the ad because I haven't paid them for the last two. I'll threaten to sue them. Get the ad in. Like step one, promote. Get it? Like it doesn't say, well, you know, say promote. Do whatever the hell you have to do to get the word out. Two, change your operating basis. Stop waiting until the stat crashes to start promotion. It's kind of a novel idea, isn't it? Like promote. Oh, I remember. So you'd get that going. Then it says, can, like, change your operating basis. If it says, for, if, for instance, you went into a condition of emergency and you didn't change after you promoted, you didn't make any changes in your operational, you just had another condition of emergency. So you'd want to get promotion in as a regular thing. Like, whatever the hell it is you do, Literally, if you go, well, I go to Kiwanis meetings to get my... Then start going to a ton of them. Go to them, find a different club, join seven of them. But do something where you're constantly promoting. You say, well, I get it from door knocking. Then knock all the time. I, I remember in 2008, first quarter, <coughs> I talked to an agent who said his ad, get this, in early 2008 his ad in Landon Homes wasn't working anymore. I asked him what he was going to do. He canceled the ad. I said, how do you get most of your business from my ad in Landon Homes? Hmm. It's how to fix it up there. It's how to get you going. You understand what I just said? He took the one thing he had been doing and stopped doing it. The ad didn't work. Does that mean ads don't work or what he was advertising wasn't making the phone ring. In 2004, I had an ad on the air that said I can sell your house in spite of the market. I stupidly left that ad on the air so in late in mid-2005 it was still on the air. Oh, I remember a busboy could have sold their home in spite of the market. Some did. So, if your marketing or prospecting your button or offer would have to match what the public believes is true. And notice I didn't say what is true, it's what they believe is true. So if they think things are fantastic, and you, I, I remember, I get a call from a guy, this was, uh, I don't know, late 2008, and he said, uh, we want to hire you. And I said, to do what? Well, we've got this giant condo conversion project. I said, oh, you don't want me. I don't do condo conversions. You need to call Dean Selfie. He's with Remax. He's the number one condo conversion guy in the area. Nobody knows more than Dean on condo conversions. Call him. Oh, we have him listed with Dean now. I said, what do you want me to do? Oh, we want to hire you as our spokesman. I said, to say what? Well, to tell people about how the economy is really good. I said, I get it now. Here's what I want you to do first. I want you to get a Mormon and a Catholic, 
and I want you to sit them down across from each other and have them convert each other. And when they're done, give me a call. <laughs> You're not going to change people's minds on what they believe is true. Let's, let's just start with that. They, they're going to think whatever the hell they think, and you're not going to come along and go, I'll tell you the right thing to think. No, you're not. You're not going to do that. So you're going to be effective if you communicate into what they already believe is true. That's just the deal. So surveys are the key to stats. That's a quote from Mr. Hubbard. What does someone, what does the public think? So might a person have to fine-tune their ad from time to time? Yeah. It's interesting that if you're prospecting, you have the ability already to do this, but it's invisible. If you attempt a script that doesn't work, you instantly change it and keep trying to find something the customer will agree to, and you might take three guesses, and the third one works, and you're oblivious to the fact that you just conducted a survey and gathered, if you will, public opinion at least from them. If you did that five or six times, you'd have the current button of what someone will respond to, keyword, now. The market, the economy, and public perception of it changes about as rapidly as fashion does, only it's invisible because most agents aren't seeing it. So again, it's not what is fact, it's what people believe is true. There are numerous people right now because they're just obsessed with something could be wrong and they never know what they're talking about anyway, who've switched over from yip-yapping, this is National Economist, yip-yappers and writers on the national scene, instead of talking about the shadow inventory, which I remember never existed, I've been personally saying that for four years, it's complete crap, now that's not what they're saying. They're now saying that hedge funds like Blackstone are going to just change the marketplace because they own so much and are buying so much, it's what's driving the market. Now here's a news flash. That statement is complete crap. Every journalist, every person saying it, does not have the slightest idea what they're talking about. They go, well, Blackstone has six billion dollars worth. Really? How fascinating. So that's a big number to you. Now juxtapose it against how much real estate is actually owned. If we said that Chinese people alone in any given year here buy twice that much, and no one's saying the Chinese are running the market for residential real estate, the actual percent, these, but you understand, they don't, they don't have no, no ability to evaluate, actually evaluate statistics, so people talk about stuff, people believe things. It doesn't make them true. It doesn't make them true. So the point I'm getting is surveys. Do a survey. Find out what someone thinks. If you run an ad and the ad doesn't work, one of two things is true. It's a bad offer or it's a bad medium to run that ad in. One of the two is true. That's just the deal. But, doesn't, but, but you could have both of them be true. But if the ad's proven to work, then you test it somewhere else. or change. But you tweak it and go, because sometimes you can miss by an inch, you miss by a mile in marketing. When you're talking to someone, it's easier to see that. That's the only point I'm making. So go back to here. Change your operating basis. We're on page 31 now. Now look at this. Step three of emergency is economize. Step three of emergency is economize. Here you would clamp it down. This is after. What if on step one for promote you had to buy a new car on time payments? I'm not making a joke. Like, realtor, my nephew came back from Australia, completely broke, Remax agent, didn't have any money, lived in California, had to have a car. What were his options? Hitchhike around town to show property or go buy a car on time payments? All I ever told him, don't ever buy a car on time payments, pay cash, don't, don't buy a car. If you can't afford to write a check, you can't afford the car. In the conversation. What did I tell him this time? Buy the car. Promote. Promote. So a decent car would be promotion. You change your operating base. But economize is step three of emergency. Step four, prepare to deliver. 
Guy says, we should hold open houses. I don't have any houses to hold open. Well, find some somebody will let you hold open. Like, do something. Like, there's never a point where you go, you know, it's weird, I don't have... People give, come into this business all the time. They, aren't, they don't have an established track record. And they, some, some people somehow make it. So what are they doing? Well, whatever that is, it seems to work. Get the idea. And step five, part of the condition of emergency contains this little line, you have to stiffen, dis stiffen discipline. Like, a person got into a condition of emergency by basically, and notice the first, first word here on the title of this booklet, Ethics and the Conditions. What would be out ethics? Non-optimum survival. It's optimum survival to succeed, to win. So if you go, if you say, I want, you know, somebody comes in this business, does anyone really come in, do I hope to fail? They go, I want to be successful. Well, what would it take to be successful? What would success consist of? What would it look like? It's actually not mysterious. It can seem that way, but it's actually not mysterious. I tell, when we hire people, there's nothing out of my office we do. Like if you say, I, I have one of the biggest, longest, successful operations. Callaway's have an incredibly successful business. There is absolutely nothing that Joseph and Joanne do, and there's nothing we do that's proprietary information. This isn't like Apple or Microsoft where there's some secret and go, no one. There's nothing we do in my office, nothing, that isn't teachable and learnable by anyone who'd want to learn it. That, that's a fact. And, and some people say, well, aren't you worried about someone stealing your secrets? I guess, I guess the same way Walmart must be worried about if someone finds out their secret. Oh, I remember they have low prices and they're friendly when you walk in. Is there some other secret and they have an amazing distribution system? But you understand. There's nothing Walmart sells that you can't buy at some other store within a few miles of their store. Nothing. They have no proprietary information. They have no proprietary merchandise. They're damn good at marketing. Damn good at marketing. So is Callaway's. They're damn good at marketing. They do a great job, but, but the point I'm getting at is there isn't some secret information. There's nothing that can't be replicated. For those of you who've read the book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, for those of you that know about the book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, if you're an agent listening to this, I, I, I couldn't over-recommend it. Do you know that when Dave Jenks and Jay Papasan and Gary Keller wrote that book, I'm one of the 15 agents in that book. Do you know how they picked the 15 agents to be in that book? Most Keller Williams agents don't know what I'm about to tell you. Because there were agents, there was one woman they found that sold her, her commissions in the year they wrote that book, were four and a half million dollars. That's how much she made, and she was not included in the book. She had, I think it was 87 clients, and she was not accepting new ones. I'm not making this up. She only sold houses to and for investors. And the reason they didn't put her in the book is she did not have a replicatable business model. The people that they chose for the book, and I know Don Zalesnik was in the book, but at the time what Don was doing could have been replicated, like people like me, Bill Ryan, Mike Mendoza. I'm just rattling off a couple names here locally because at the time they did it, every single one of us had were doing things that anyone who wanted to could have done them. You understand what I'm saying here? Replicatable, that was the whole point. So they didn't, they, the way they wrote the book is they took and after they picked us as the role models, they then went through and went, what did we all have in common? Did you get that last? It wasn't who, what spectacular, miraculous personality thing did Mike Mendoza, when he walked into the room, and he's 6'6", and he just was so magnificent. That's not the kind of crap they put in the book. They put stuff in the book that you go, Michael and Russell and Bill and Don all do this. I hope, you understand, it was something anybody could go, well, hell, I'll just read the book and do what it says, which was sort of the whole idea. Am I making sense on this? So the conditions here, there are 12 of them. You're in one of them in any area of your life, you're in one of these conditions. 
And if you can just read this and apply it and dig yourself out, if you find yourself stuck in some condition, I'm going to, for example, if you find yourself stuck in doubt and you just cannot get out of doubt, I want you to get Sherry's card before the lady right here. I want you to get her card or give her yours or do somehow, because she's an expert of, of taking and digging someone out of the condition if they're stuck in it. But in most cases, most everybody can actually read this stuff, just look it over, figure statistically where you're at, and apply that formula to that condition. And there's a line I want you to read on page 48. I said this at the earlier part tonight, but I want to say it again. <coughs> This is, it says, conditions application. A vital thing to realize is that, is that the formulas of conditions exist. They are part and parcel of any activity in this universe, and now that they are known, they must be complied with. This takes about 90% of chance out of business operation and personal economics. The variables are only how well one estimates the situation and how energetic one is in applying the formulas. The proper application of the proper formula works. It works no matter how stupidly it is applied, only so long as the right formula is applied and the exact sequence of steps is taken. Brilliance only shows up in the speed of recovery or expansion. Very brilliant applications show up in overnight sound expansions. Dull applications, given only that they are correct, show up in slower expansions. In other words, nobody has to be a screaming genius to apply them or dream up the necessary ideas in them. You, you understand? So do this. And, and, you know, you could say, well, how will you know if you're doing it right? You'll see your statistic improve. It's that simple. Whatever stat you're working on, and if the stat's not improving, how about this for a newsflash? You're not doing the formula. You're not doing it right yet. That feedback alone, you understand? It, but you can. Like, this is not tricky. It's just, if, if your stats crash, you have to get it up. If your stats up, hopefully you want to keep it up. Questions, comments, anything? Yes, sir? I have a question about that Holmes and Lane guy. Yeah. Let's say he's been running the app for two years straight. He gets ten phone calls a month. Uh-huh. And then all of a sudden gets five. Do mm -hmm. you think that he has, even though he's been doing the same app for two years, so it's pretty consistent? Do yep. you think he's starting to get, because he gets half the phone calls, he needs to tweak it? Well, yeah, obviously. Okay. If you go surveys are the key to stats. So the fact that something's worked, like let's just take the price alone. Like what if, if you remember what was happening in 2008 that wasn't happening in two. In 2000, the, the years when he was successfully running the ad, the prices in Phoenix were continually accelerating. Even if they accelerated slowly, like in 2004 prices were going up, in 2003 prices were going up, in early 2005 prices were going up. Prices were going up at a fast enough clip that if you overpriced a property, it didn't matter, just have the listing long enough and it'll catch up. Okay. Now, what was happening in 2008 to prices? They were in a free fall. They were falling at a rate that couldn't even be calculated or conceived of. Listings that looked like they would easily sell for 450 wouldn't fetch 300. In fact, that was, that was actually happening. So he hadn't changed what he was doing in the ad. Like, there were absolutely ads that made the phone ring in 2008. Absolutely. Most of them were being uh, run by people selling REO properties at that time, as a matter of fact. But there were absolutely ads that would make the phone ring. And there were ads that the public would ignore in droves. So 2008, buyers were looking for bargains. When his, when his ad that he was still running, what they were looking for was, I, I want something before it goes higher. Big difference. He didn't know that. He didn't know either one of those things. What he knew was he ran an ad and it didn't work anymore. Am I getting your question? Yes, sir. So it doesn't mean, like I don't do print ads. I haven't run a print ad in well over 20 years. So my, this isn't a thing of like use land and homes. But what I'm saying is 
if he successfully was using land in homes, and they were still distributing it to the same number of people, there's no reason that you couldn't successfully continue doing it. And particularly since in his case, it was how he got the bulk of his business, if he's not going to do that, he better have some other plan for doing it. Because what he was doing was routing himself out of the business, which is where he went. So, did I get your question? I'm not going to use homes and lands. No, that's my point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't use them. No, I don't. Because <laughs> I use them so often. So. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> Anything else? Anything? I thank you so much for coming. I hope I've solved a problem or two. Thank you.